Good afternoon. This is our video class to replace the class that we weren't able to have in person. I wanted to make sure to go over the story for you so that you will be all caught up and you're not disadvantaged by not meeting today since we have a test scheduled for Thursday. In this segment, I'm going to review books 17 and 18. We didn't get 17 in class last time and 18 is the first portion of the new reading. Then I will do 19, 20, and 21 in a separate video so that the video is not too long. So here we go. When we left our heroes, and I say that in the plural because I'm talking about Odysseus and Telemachus, they were at the swine herder's house, Eumaeus, and you might remember that Athena had made Odysseus look like a beggar. She took him out of beggar disguise so that he could be introduced to his son Telemachus. And then after they had their tearful reunion, she turned him back into a beggar. So at this point, when Eumaeus comes back into his little hut, um, he doesn't suspect anything. He doesn't know that this is Odysseus. So Telemachus now has to get his father up to the palace, but he can't just walk back with him because the connection between them can't be obvious. So what he does is he tells Eumaeus, take the beggar into town. It's time for him to stop mooching off of you. Take him into town and teach him how to beg from the people there. He's enough of this. So meanwhile, Telemachus goes back to the palace alone, and this puts a little bit of time and space in between their arrivals so that no one suspects anything. Um, the typical thing happens when Telemachus arrives. The nurse, Eurycleia, starts crying, and his mother starts crying because they thought that the suitors were going to ambush him on the high seas and kill him. Remember that they had been told this. So this is another one of those instances where we see a change in Telemachus's behavior. Um, earlier we saw him, right after he had talked to Athena, we saw him tell his mom, go back to your room and tend to your spinning and womanly chores. So now when his mother's crying, he says, oh mom, um, take a bath and put out put on some fresh clothes and make a sacrifice to Zeus. So he's telling his mom what to do. Um, he doesn't outright say it, but it seems implicit that he doesn't want her to spoil her beauty by crying. So take a bath. It'll calm you down, mom. I'm the man of the house now. So it tells us again what Homer thinks a woman's role is, which is basically shut up and do as you're told. Um, Telemachus now is going to face the suitors. They're obviously disappointed that he made it back alive. Athena waves a little magic wand and she makes him look bigger and more impressive because after all, um, from their perspective, they don't know that Odysseus is alive. Um, this is the crown prince about to become king. So she wants them to feel a little bit intimidated by him. They greet him warmly. They are such sarcastic, um, conniving people. They don't want him to know that they don't like him. So they're like, Oh, little prince, so great to see that you're back. So glad that you made it safely. But they have murder in their hearts because remember, they're plotting to get away with him on, or to do away with him on land since they couldn't do away with him at sea. Um, so he now sits down and tells his mom the whole story. And he tells his mom that Odysseus is alive, but that he's on Calypso's island. So he doesn't spill the beans that dad is back in Ithaca. So Penelope is still unaware that her husband has come home. And I'm not sure she really believes Telemachus, that, that Odysseus is alive. Um, meanwhile, there is a local seer. Um, you might remember that Odysseus went to see a, a very famous prophet called Tiresias, who was in the House of the Dead. But his town, Ithaca, has its own seer, um, Theoclemnus, who says, I've been reading the signs of the bird entrails, and I know that Odysseus is already home. So this is a little forewarning to the suitors, but they're not smart enough to get it. Meanwhile, um, now the suitors have sat down to their normal evening feast, which is using up, of course, all of the stores that belong to Penelope and Telemachus. And Eumaeus and Odysseus arrive at the palace. Telemachus is now acting like he's in charge. He takes Eumaeus, who's a very low servant, he's a pig herder, and seats him at the table. And then after a little while, he gives some food from his own plate to Eumaeus and says, go give it to that beggar by the door. The beggar by the door, of course, is Odysseus, who came in with Eumaeus. Um, interestingly, by the way, when Odysseus comes in, the only person who recognizes him is his old dog. That's kind of cute. Um, so Odysseus now makes the rounds of the table begging, and you can almost imagine him with some, you know, holding his little hands out like this, or maybe he has a little bowl, and he goes around to each of the su suitors and 
and begs for food. He's really playing up his role. And all of them give him food except one guy whose name is Antinous. And you want to keep an eye on this guy because he's going to come back later. Um, he threatens Odysseus, says, get away from me. If you don't, uh, I'm going to throw something at you. And indeed, he eventually hurls his footstool. They sit, they sit with chairs and they have little footstools for their feet so they can be extra comfortable. And he picks up his footstool and he hurls it at Odysseus. Um, the other suitors warn him, and this is an important um, piece of data for our knowledge of how the gods treated people and what they expected of humans. They warn him that the gods sometimes walk among men in disguise as beggars. And so you should not be so mean to beggars and you should always give something to beggars because you never know when it might be a god. Um, obviously Odysseus is not a god but remember that he might be the grandson of Hermes. At any rate um, Penelope sees this and remember that Antinous is one of the suitors who is trying to win her hand and she says you should be ashamed of yourself. So she's saying you want to marry me and you're acting like this in my house? I don't think so. So she then sends word to Odysseus. So she, there's some distance between them in the room, but she sends one of the servants over to tell him that she would like to speak to him privately. Um, she thinks that as a world traveler, he's remember he said that he's from Crete, blah, blah, blah. Um, she thinks that he might have some news about her husband. So Odysseus sends word back that he won't meet with her right now, but after sundown, when the suitors go home, and they do go home every night, um, that would be a good time for them to meet. So that's the end of chapter I'm sorry, book 17. So now we turn to book 18. There's another beggar. Um, he's called Iris for short. His real name is Arenas. And he comes along and he sees Odysseus on the porch. The meal is over. Odysseus has gone outside. And Iris, that's his territory. That's where he hangs out and that's where he begs. So just like sometimes street people fight about their territory, he's really angry that Odysseus is out on the porch and he challenges him to a duel. Um, Odysseus rolls up his rags and he gets ready to fight and Athena makes him look like he's a real Hulk and of course he beats the other guy. So the question I was going to ask you in class is why does Athena even get involved in this little male scuffle? And in my view the reason is that she's getting Odysseus ready for a battle. So she wants to kind of provoke him and get his adrenaline and testosterone going so that when it does come to a battle, and you can feel it coming, uh, that he will be riled up and, and ready for the battle. Meanwhile, Athena, I think she's doing this just for fun, she makes Penelope look even more gorgeous and gets the suitors all riled up with lust. Um, and then she makes Penelope fall asleep and she makes her face beautiful with all these kind of goddess um, products. Now we see how smart Penelope is. Penel Penelope says, look, actually this is her terrible dilemma. She says, before Odysseus left for Troy, he and I had a discussion about what would happen if he didn't come back. And he made me promise that if he did not return by the time a beard appeared on Telemachus' face, um, that she should at that point choose the man who pleases her best and in his words, leave your house behind, meaning, you know, forget about this marriage, it's over. Um, and she should, she should go with her new husband to his home, leaving the palace to Telemachus. So the business about the beard is really about coming of age. So when Telemachus is mature enough to wear a beard, um, at that point he's come of age and his father wants him to inherit. The idea of Penelope marrying in Odysseus's mind is that it would get her out of the palace and Telemachus could then rise up and become king. Odysseus did not foresee that if Penelope remarried that her new husband would become king because his son should inherit. Um, so the idea is once Telemachus could be king then you have to remove yourself and that way you're taken care of and I don't have to worry that my lovely wife is not being provided for. Of course the suitors have a completely different plan. Um, but she doesn't let that let on that she's onto them. So she says, I, I understand now that I have no choice. I have to remarry. Remember, she doesn't know that Odysseus is back and she's not really convinced that he's alive. Um, 
But she says, and this is where I think she's very clever, she says, you guys don't act like normal suitors. Normal suitors bring gifts. They're trying to please the would-be bride. But you guys are taking my stuff. Instead of giving me stuff, you're taking my stuff. Why should I like any one of you? And they all kind of slap their forehead and they go, oh, she's right. And she's getting ready to marry. So we better, we better impress her. So they all send their servants home to go get, you know, silver jugs and porcelain plates and whatever, whatever, um, beautiful jewelry. And everyone's going to try to one up the other, right? Very clever on Penelope's part because she's going to get a whole lot of loot. There's a lot of suitors. And she's going to get something or maybe multiple somethings from every single one of those suitors. So I say good on you, Penelope. She's a lot smarter than people people think so. Think. And Odysseus is watching all this. Remember, he's there. And she doesn't know he's there. And he's actually very impressed. Um, but Athena then whips up the suitors to harass Odysseus and make his anguish deeper. Again, I think she's doing that because she's trying to get him ready for battle. So she's actually trying to make him really mad so that when he goes into battle, he's like, I'm going to kill you all. Um, Telemachus now, emboldened by his mother, speaks up and says, this food and wine you've been consuming has gone to your head, so you guys best go home and go to bed. Um, and they're actually pretty impressed with him. So he's speaking more and more like a king. And again, this is evidence of how Telemachus has changed. Remember that before he went on his journey, he tried to speak the, to the suitors and he lost control, threw down the um, speaker's staff and burst into tears. So now he's able to hold his own and they're very impressed by this. So that concludes chat books 17 and 18. And the next video will cover the remaining portion of our discussion for today. Thanks. Bye-bye.